thanks, Steve. I now understand why Kay Dickerson was, had her hand like this the whole time she was up here. <laughs> this is the Klieg lights. Um, oh, I'm supposed to advance the slides. Um, it's great to be here for the, what is it, the first biennial conference? Yes. Awesome, okay. Biennial, biannual, I'm not sure which one is okay. the right word. The first one, the this first is great, one. okay. Um, we're talking about policies and, uh, what did we just, aha. Uh -huh. So what I want to, the, the, the bottom line of what I'm going to talk about is that there are some existing policies, as you all know, about trial disclosure. By the way, I'm going to be limiting my talks pretty much to clinical trials. I know this conference covers all sorts of research, but I'm talking about clinical trials because that's what I know about. I'm going to talk about existing policies because, again, my meta message is going to be there are existing policies. They're underutilized by all stakeholders, and there's a lot that can be gained by utilizing them to their fullest potential. And also, my other bottom line will be that any new policies or new things that people invent that you want to talk about, of which there are many that could be useful, should be done in a way that, in my opinion, don't, doesn't undermine the existing policies. So the two policies that you probably all know about are the journal editor's policy, ICMJE, which um, took effect, it was announced in 2004, took effect in 2005, requires the registration of all clinical trials. That's, of course, an international policy. It's the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, and it um, is not legally binding. What happens is the journal gets to turn down your manuscript, but it had a huge impact. Um, FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act in 2007, took that a step further and said in the United States, it made registration a legal requirement for certain drug and device trials, and then went even further, which was to say that you had to report the results, that we at clinicaltrials.gov had to invent a structured database for results, and we had to um, accept results from studies, and I'll show you more about that in a minute. <clears throat> But let's look at the goals. We think of it as the trial reporting system. And it's a system because it involves both the structures and the policies that support the use of those structures. So trial registration is to ensure a public listing of the trials. This is um, to quote Rob Califf, there shouldn't be any more secret trials. Um, to mitigate selective reporting, to ensure fidelity to the protocol. Then universal summary results reporting. The thing about having a results database as opposed to journal publication, is that it's not left to the whim of a journal editor or an author or a peer reviewer. At clinicaltrials.gov, if you submit results and they meet the requirements, meaning that they um, make sense and they fulfill the requirements, we post it. We're not judging whether it's a good trial, whether it's an interesting trial, whether the comparator made sense, whether we think it has any import. We're just trying to make a record of what happened. And then the third policy which gets talked about, has been talked about already this morning, is the sharing of participant level data, which I think of as having three main goals. One is to enable an audit for, tra for summary results. So right now people report the summary results and outside of a FOIA or a lawsuit, it's hard to get the participant level data to, to replicate or not replicate that. To um, enable new analyses, and to enable the combining of data. Those are the kinds of things people talk about. It's important to keep those three in your mind separate, I think. Um, so there are two new policies that are building on the registration and results reporting. Again, this is focused on the United States. Um, the first, and these were both announced in November. There was a period of public comment. The period of co public comment is over. And now at NIH and HHS, we're going through all the comments. There were over 900. Um, and we're coming out with final policies soon. Before anyone asks, I don't know when, so I can't tell you when. Um, so the first policy would extend, so FDA covers results reporting for certain trials of drugs and devices. And it's pretty complicated to figure out which ones and when they have to report. The new, the proposed NIH policy would say all clinical trials funded by NIH, including some that FDA doesn't cover, meaning things that don't involve drugs and devices, including phase one trials, including phase zero trials. They would have to be reported, meaning they have to be registered, the results have to be reported on a certain timeline, 
and the primary stick that NIH has is they can stop paying you. <laughs> they, they can stop your you know, um, ongoing funding and they could prevent future funding. Okay, and that's a big stick. Then the other thing is the um, regulations under FDA, which gave the Secretary of HHS the ability to expand some of the requirements. And that will, ex and the proposal, which was out for public comment, calls for expanding to include results of trials of unapproved products, which wasn't in the initial set of re rules. So those are two big expansions, meaning that more and more trials under these two policies have to report results. They all have to register at clinicaltrials.gov. They would have to report results to clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and this is just a summary, a tabular view of the policies. Again, the ICMJE policy is just registration. The other two cover registration and results reporting. This is um, each bar, which I'm sure you can read in detail, um, represents an academic medical center in the United States, each vertical bar. And what we're showing is that with the two new proposed policies, the NIH and the expansion of FDA, the vertical axis is the percentage of studies sponsored by the Academic Medical Center that will have to report results. And you could see the mean and the median are both around 60%, so that for many, many academic medical, for most academic medical centers in the United States, when these two policies take effect, most of the trials that are being done at those centers are gonna have to report results to clinicaltrials.gov. We like to think that that means a tipping point is being reached where um, deans and vice pro, you know, people in charge of the purse strings at academic medical centers can't continue to um, not provide resources to doing this and have to pay attention to this. And for both policies, by the way, the academic medical center is generally the one on the hook. The investigator, it's not gonna be a happy day for the investigator either, but the academic medical center is on the hook. So it means institutional responsibility. There are other policies that are building on these. In this country, PCORI, the VA, CMS, they require registration and results reporting for certain studies. So this is a, a pyramid that I like to show to show that when you're talking about participant level data, even though it's the newest thing and it's like the shiny thing that everyone's paying attention to and we're all mesmerized by it, it only makes sense in my mind if it's built on top of a good Vigor, um, complete trial registration process, so you have the complete list, the denominator, if you will, of all trials, and the summary results for those trials. And then on top of that comes the IPD. And I really keep emphasizing this, but please don't let the attention that's being paid to IPD undermine the attention that needs to be paid to registration and results reporting. Um, this is, you can't read this, this is about Paxil Study 329. It was in the news again recently when the riot, the Restoring Invisible Trials, just published a reanalysis of the data from that study. And this was a GSK study from the early 2000s, and it was Paxil was one of the tipping points that led to the ICMJE policy, I'd say. Um, but there were many problems with GSK and the Paxil studies, and only one of them required sharing of participant level data. The policies about not publishing negative trials would have been dealt with if there had been a good registration policy and a good summary results reporting policy. The issues of changing the pre-specified outcome measures would have been picked up again with registration and results reporting. And it was only the misclassification of adverse events that could only be found through analysis of the participant level data. But by the way, it was only because the, the authors of this reanalysis had access to the very raw data, the case report forms. If they had had access to what the IOM called for, which was just the coded data set, they wouldn't have known that the adverse events had been misclassified and they couldn't have reclassified them. So I think it's really important when you think about the problems that you're trying to solve with new proposals that you are very precise in figuring out what tool or what policy tool would be needed to address that. Um, so the other thing is about the current system is that it has more value than it's being used for. So for example, registration policies have been in place for a while, but we found that about a third of trials from NIH industry and other sponsors are registered at least three months late, meaning that there are systems in, or that there aren't systems in place at those sponsors that are requiring registration to occur before the trial starts. 
for the NIH studies, 60% of the late registered ones were registered more than 12 months late, which means that at academic medical centers throughout the country, trials are starting and in many cases completing without ever having been registered. That's something that can be addressed without new policies. I mean, you need policies with a small p at the academic medical centers, but you don't need new rules or new laws. Um, and I'm gonna, the, the la I'll just skip to the last bullet, which is that there's a persistent lack of concordance between the registered and the reported outcome measures. And this is something journal editors and peer reviewers are not using trial registries to look at. They are not, at the best journals, we're continuing to find that the published outcome measure, the thing that they say, this is the pre-specified outcome measure, and it's right there in clinicaltrials.gov is something different, and nobody's looking. So again, doesn't need a new policy, just needs someone to use it. Um, this I'll just put out for discussion. This was in JAMA Internal Medicine a couple of weeks ago. It was um, the PREDIMED study, which started by saying that um, they had already published the primary data, and they said, it was a pre-specified secondary outcome measure was that we were gonna look at breast cancer, and it turns out that adherence to a Mediterranean diet reduced the incidence of breast cancer. So I looked at the registration, which in this case was in a different registry, it was an ISRCTN, and I can't read the monitor, but the secondary outcome measures were, quote, death of any cause, an incidence of angina, angina, et cetera, heart failure, diabetes, dementia, and cancer. So the question is, does that count as pre-specification in order to help you to think of that as not a post hoc analysis? I don't know, but it doesn't seem obvious to me. So that's an example where my guess is that the editor or the peer reviewers didn't look at the registry. So other policy options. Um, please don't undermine the existing trial reporting system when you make pronouncements. And, and various groups have done this at various times. I don't mean to call these out. This is an open letter to presidential candidates asking them if they're in favor of making participant level data available. Uh, I don't know what to say about that, except that maybe it would have been better to say, are they in favor of actually um, enforcing FADA? That might have been some, another place to start. Um, so, what? <laughs> she said, are they in favor of science? <laughs> That's another place to start. <laughs> but you don't want to ask a question you don't want to know the answer to. <laughs> um, so possible incentives. Gold stars for some specific sponsors. For example, you could do name and shame of sponsors that aren't doing well with, with um, following the policies. You can also give gold stars to those who are doing well. I think when groups are starting to list specific sponsors and how they're doing, I think that will have an impact. Um, change in the incentives to promote quality reporting. Um, IRBs, well, let me just skip to this. I'm gonna just, different things that different groups can do. Funders, use clinicaltrials.gov before you decide whether you need a new study and hold grantees accountable for accurate and timely reporting. And I have to say, NIH is really starting to do this and take this very seriously. Um, IRBs, IRBs don't do this in general. Sometimes they make sure the trial is registered. That's great. They don't look at clinicaltrials.gov or other registries to see if this next new trial is needed. Or maybe there are already three ongoing studies of the same topic that are bigger and better for some reason. Um, maybe it's not feasible. I was in an IRB meeting where they were discussing the feasibility of a, style in, of a trial in an African country about malaria. It was a tiny village, and the investigator was saying, oh yes, I know, because this is the incidence of malaria, and this is how many residents there are in the village. And during the meeting, I looked in clinicaltrials.gov, and there were four currently recruiting trials in that village on malaria, okay? So I didn't have access to secret information, but I wasn't on the IRB. Um, oh, importantly, sorry, I should go back to the IRB one, but I don't know the back thing. Um, please use this to, to, if you're not using it to weigh the risks and benefits of a new intervention, then you're just pretending. If, the, if your assessment of the risks and benefits is ba based on severe publication bias that we all know exists, then that's a disservice to potential participants in clinical trials. Academic medical centers can really provide scientific leadership and institutional resources. Actually, there's an article, the pub, a group at Duke, um, I like to think under Rob's leadership, 
actually took this on and published their experience with actually forming a unit to ensure that trials were properly registered and their results were reported at clinicaltrials.gov and it made a big difference. Um, and create educational resources and define best practices that support quality trial documentation. That is why you're doing the trial. People sort of forget this, but that is why you're doing the trial. Um, trialists, before you start a trial, you might want to consider making sure it's actually a question that hasn't already been answered. Um, once the trial is designed and funded, register it with specificity with care. It actually matters. Please use the NCT number, which is the unique identifier when communicating about the trial. And once it's completed, take the time to enter accurate and complete summary results. This really matters. Journal editors and peer reviewers can ensure that the registration is prior to the start date, has meaningful and specific entries. If nobody's looking, then nobody's going to be putting in meaningful and specific entries. Verify that the manuscript you get is consistent with the record on clinicaltrials.gov. And check the denominator. Trial registration isn't magically going to prevent publication bias. It's only going to prevent publication bias if you have a journal editor, when you get a Paxil study submitted to you, you go in and notice that there are nine unpublished Paxil studies, and you ask about that. Um, and then there's things that clinicaltrials.gov needs to do, which I can just take to heart. I don't need to go over with you guys. And then people were talking about, I think Brian Nosek was talking about, and Kay Dickerson was talking about how many places they need to go to look for information. In terms of clinical trials, at least, to the extent that people use the NCT number to communicate about their trial, we can help going from a world of informational chaos to a nice world where our very excellent search engine can help you to find all the information about a trial. In this regard, we're just in the middle of implementing something that the journal editors have asked for. It's called the 21st data element. It's saying um, at registration, what is your plan for sharing participant level data at the end of the study and associated metadata? And then at the end of the study, you get to say whether you've shared it and where it is and which types of metadata, which documents are available and where. So again, the hope is that this would be a place where you could go to find the information. And um, I think I'll stop. Oh, remember, don't forget about the unsexy registration and results reporting while you're talking about IPD. So I'll stop there. Thank you.